Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for answering. How are you feeling this morning? You okay after last night? Excellent. Some of you are. Good. Okay, so my name is Teresa Neat. I'm going to wake up my laptop. What's your password? Oh, yeah. I'm talking to you today about Lean QA. Now, you would have seen in most DevOps conferences that you go to that someone is bound to ask you who is Dev and who is Ops. So you remember that happening yesterday? I'm extending the conversation. I'm asking what other roles we have in the room. Because T-Shape, as you will find out, is about your generalist and your specialist skills. So someone who's in DevOps would have more than one skill. So could I ask, because we're talking about QA, are there any testers in the room? Fantastic. Really, hands up high, please. Thank you. Any BAs? Perfect. Project managers? Program managers, pro. Excellent. Anyone who's a manager by, by career? Good, I see you. <laughs> Are there any other roles that I haven't called out? Okay. Support engineer, SRE, ops, I'm going to put you in the same bucket. Wow. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I asked Catherine not to do an introduction, but to do a joke. So I can do my introduction myself. I am a T-shaped tester, which means that I host and maintain my own website, so you will find me up there if you want to read more about me. Uh, if, if, uh, if you notice, I have an accent. I'm a South African who lives in Melbourne. Um, I've heard heaps of South African accents here today, so are there any other South Africans in the room? Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. The one thing the Aussies can't beat out of me is my love of rugby. I'm really pleased to see that there's rugby um, on the TV screens here. And if you really want to know, my super rugby team is the Bulls. Sorry. <laughs> it's a religious choice. OK. My day job is I work for REA Group, which is a digital agency. We are based in Melbourne. We're fairly progressive. We are well known for some of the open source things we do and some of the innovation and the uh, agile and DevOps areas that we play in. My role is a developer advocate, which if you know the name Kelsey Hightower, he's a developer advocate for Kubernetes. He is what I consider the gold standard for developer advocacy. He's extraordinary. So I will not compare myself to Kelsey, but I am doing a similar role. And where Kelsey is external facing, I'm internal facing. So we know Kelsey because he's external facing. I'm internal facing, I support the developers and the tech people in REA who consume the products that we produce in the platform and architecture team. So we, we've made it, we're very autonomous, we allow people to create their own tools, but we've also asked people to make it easy to reuse the tools. And so when you do create a tool that we want you to, um, to farm out to other people, we bring it into our team and we make it consumable, and that includes providing some documentation and support um, and other things that you need to, to make it easy to use. I have a career of uh, 20 years in QA, so before I became a developer advocate, I was a QA. I still am a QA no matter what I do. So um, the platform and architecture team not only gained a developer advocate, they also got a QA, two for one. In my spare time, I write for DevOps Agenda, which is a Tech Target publication. And uh, they found one of my articles that I wrote for the REA Tech blog, and they said, well, we need people talking about DevOps who are not Dev and Ops, and because you are, could you please write for us? I did. Uh, my articles ended up being far more engaging than any of the other authors, so they invited me to the um, advisory board, which I accepted, because one, we need more women, and we need more non-Dev and Ops people in this conversation. 
In my other spare time, I co-organise and have co-founded DevOps Girls, which is a workshop we run in Melbourne. And we, we help women do more DevOps, especially at the entry level, because as soon as you've opened the door, your self-study can improve. But it's get, getting over that fear level, stepping into that door that we encourage women to do, and any non-binary gender. We're going to define a few terms because I want to be very specific about the context that I'm using them in today. So the first one is testing, and I'll read it to you. Testing is an empirical technical investigation of a product done on behalf of stakeholders with the intention of revealing quality-related information of the kind that they seek. This is a quote by Dr. Kem Kainer, who, along with Jerry Weinberg, are probably the topmost luminaries in the testing field. There's some key words we need to highlight here. First one is empirical, which means it's an action, it's an investigation, it's an exploration. It's not something we do as a theory or a speculation. It's a technical investigation, which I will tell you only humans can do. Machines don't do very good investigations. It reveals information. It doesn't make a judgment call on pass or fail. It's a different paradigm. The other term is QA, which I think most of you would define as quality assurance. Does anyone feel we can assure the quality of products, of, of software? I, I don't think so. I think it's a misnomer. So quality assurance is a term that was borrowed from the production lines of the car factories in particular where you had quality assurance at the end that assured that this was defect-free and you were safe to drive the vehicle. It's an American term, so you'll find QA more used in American contexts. I define it slightly differently. I say QA is quality analysis. If you work for Atlassian, they will say it's quality assistance. And how I define it is the entire process of building in and raising awareness and ownership of quality, which humans do particularly well. You'll see there's a human factor in my talk today. DevOps has been defined loosely by many people. The one I like to use is Damon Edwards' definition. If you know him, please listen to his podcast. It's extraordinary. He says DevOps is an umbrella concept that refers to anything that smooths out the interaction between development and operations. Did you notice he doesn't say developers and operations engineers? It's the actions of development and operations. There are four guiding principles or four core values. First is culture. The second is automation, which we tend to hear a lot of at conferences. Third is measuring, which thankfully Francois talked about yesterday. Thank you very much. Fourth is sharing. You can find more uh, definitions in the DevOps dictionary. That's how I define DevOps. It's not about tooling necessarily. It may involve some tooling but there are human factors involved in DevOps. Does anyone know the history of, of DevOps? Well, let me refresh your memory. It starts way before Patrick Dubois. It starts with Lean. It starts with Teichi Ono, at least, at, as far as we know, what we have on record. When he went into the Toyota plant and created the Toyota production system, TPS. The Americans liked it so much, uh, Dr. Deming took it over to the US and he created Lean in the 70s. And Dr. Goldratt, who is an engineer by trade, created the theory of constraints, which you would learn about in the Phoenix Project, if you've read that. These, these all underpin DevOps. They are all the predecessors of the term DevOps and the practice of DevOps. The Agile Manifesto was based on Lean.
But the problem with the Agile Manifesto is it talked only about development. And it excluded operations from the conversation. So it wasn't long after that that Patrick Dubois and Andrew Clay Schaefer talked about Agile infrastructure. This is before the DevOps term came into being. And this is a funny story, if, if I believe it to be correct. Um, Andrew Clay Schaefer proposed the talk, Agile Infrastructure, and only Patrick Dubois showed up at the conference. Apparently, not even the speaker showed up because there was no interest. So apparently, uh, Patrick Dubois just showed up to an em empty room. However, it was good enough to, to start the conversation and what we then followed was John Allspore and Hammond talking about their 10 plus deploys at Flickr. And they started using the terms dev and ops in the same context, in the same sentence. Now we're starting to hear language, dev ops. And Patrick Dubois, who wasn't there at the time, who heard about this, went, there's my term. And so it's very fitting to for him to create DevOps Days, which I will say is the first time we've used the terms DevOps as a noun or as an adjective. So what this means is, by the way, you are at DevOps Days, which is um, what I will say the, the, um, the mothership of, of DevOps conferences. I'm, I'm very impressed. I feel like I'm quite close to the main line right now. I'm not a very big fan of the dilution of DevOps that's taken place. I'm very pleased to be here. And I think that, that you are here also shows, whether it's by luck or, or by planning, it shows that you are close to the main line as well. This information is important because my, the rest of my talk is based on this history. So now, we have this thing called DevOps, which is a very loosely defined term. But if you wanted to know, there's the link to Agile Infrastructure. Then the following thing happened. Take a moment to take that in. It became a dev and ops party. Other roles were excluded. Security was excluded. QA was excluded. BA was excluded. Everyone else was left outside the room. You've heard the dev sec ops term being um, bandied around recently, it's because security have now found a way to be included in the conversation. Um, I was going to create DevSec QA ops, but apparently it's too hard to say. And honestly, you shouldn't have to create a new term, just to mention that you're, you're sharing, which is part of the, the four core values. Another thing happened. If you don't see what this is, this is the tools vendors going bananas with tools and creating all sorts of shiny new things for you to play with in the name of automation. And we rebranded the ops engineer to DevOps engineer, which is an anti-pattern, I'll call that out now. I'm sorry if you called it a DevOps engineer, it's not a reflection of you, it's a reflection of the industry. DevOps engineers were put into DevOps teams, which then became a silo of their own. And so we had the same old behavior of having to, to log a ticket with your DevOps team to get environments provisioned, except now they just had shiny tools. It's an anti-pattern. It's meant to be sharing, it's meant to be co-located and sitting with each other and working with each other, even if you are across the other side of the world. And then we got cargo cults. So I'm going to define cargo cult before I show you the image. A cargo cult is behavior where you blindly copy someone else's behavior, hoping that you will get the same results. So, who's heard of the Spotify model? Yes, everyone. Guess what, it's the Spotify model. It's their model. 
But we have proliferated this copying of the Spotify model, hoping we will get the same results. And of course, you don't. The term cargo cult comes from the Second World War, where an occupied bunch of islands in Melanesia were occupied by the Americans, and um, the, the planes would come in and drop the cargo. And obviously, the American soldiers were benefited by the cargo, but so too were the indigenous people of the islands. So they were all benefiting from the cargo drops. The war ended, the planes left, the Americans left, and the indigenous people still wanted their cargo. So they formed a cult where they would pave their roads with bamboo, creating runways for planes, and they would build towers out of bamboo and sticks, who were flight towers, and they would quite literally pray and offer these to their ancestors, hoping that the planes would come back. That's where the term cargo cult originated, is where you you don't understand the mechanisms of something and therefore you copy the behavior you saw someone else do, hoping that you will now end up with the same benefits and results. So, we got cargo cults in DevOps as well. This image may be slightly obscure, but um, Alison, if she's here, she may be able to get this point. Here we go, let's see if you get this. Okay, so BuildKite is a startup in Melbourne that provides CICD um, services uh, and tooling. And I'm going to call these two folks Dev and Ops. And they are praying for the practice of CI and CD because they have possibly the logo of BuildKite. Or maybe they have a subscription, or maybe they even bought the tool. One of the cargo cult behaviors of DevOps is excluding people, and as I mentioned at the beginning. So if it isn't clear to you already where I'm going with this talk, DevOps should include testers. Always has, always should have. If you apply CAMS, which is culture, automation, measurement, and sharing, you include people. They're important stakeholders, you should. Here is my piece de resistance of my whole talk. If you thought this was QA's job or testing's job, I'm going to debunk that myth right now. This is not their job anymore. Has any tester worked a weekend for a Sunday night release? Has any tester worked to a deadline and then had to devalue the, the bugs they found so that you could certify it's release ready? This behavior is because we have lumped quality ownership onto testing and testing alone. In DevOps, everyone owns quality. The testers are just really good at testing. It doesn't mean they own quality. So this is no longer their job. Everyone should know how well your product is doing because of the correct application of DevOps up to this point. So what is it then that testers bring to the table if they are in DevOps. Firstly, critical thinking, because humans are very good at these things. Curiosity. Has anyone ever seen a tester who says, what happens if I press that button? That natural curiosity of a tester is why you want them on your team. Feedback is a skill, you should learn it as a tester. It's not something where you just determine pass or fail. By the way, pass or fail is a binary equation. If you don't know this already, I'm sure we do. 
pass or fail is an excellent machine capability. Binary is a very good machine capability. Decision trees is something machines do really well. So let them do the automated tests and let your humans do the feedback. And systems thinking. I, I remember I was on this team with a, a developer. Uh, we were creating an API. And he said to me, and it, I tell you what, it was a beautiful thing. It was a thing of beauty. And he said to me, this thing is beautifully documented. We've documented all the HTTP codes. We've tested them to hell and beyond. It's perfect. The baby is ready to be released into the wild. And being the tester that I am, I said, does the other team know what changes they are getting? No, they, they shouldn't have to because it's all documented. They can just read the documentation. It's easy to pick up. And we were having a fairly uh, um, energetic argument about this for a few days until eventually we just let it go. We agreed to disagree. And the mobile team, who was the consumer of this API, we completely crashed the UI. We gave them things they didn't want. We gave them things that they... We didn't give them things they wanted. In fact, they were waiting for us for so long, they just started developing their UI uh, without us. It was a schmozzle. So systems thinking is something that testers bring to the table really well. So in this image, we see on the far right a bunch of components or maybe petals. They are just heaped on a heap. And when you integrate them into a flower, you have a system. And a system is something that testers think of really well. We tend to think of how the messages are passed and received by the consumers that we pass them to or how they may experience the, the application or the system that we built. And if you did notice that the stem and the roots and the leaf are part of the system, and therefore I'm here to tell you today that infrastructure is part of the system, and infrastructure too needs testing explicitly, not just implicitly. So you can't just test an application and therefore imply that the infrastructure works. Your database, your APIs, your back-end systems, they all need explicit testing. So the whole system includes the application databases, the configuration and all the infrastructure. You really should let your testers loose on these things. There's no good point in restricting and constricting your testers just to the pretty things up the top. Let them loose on the other things. So as I'm implying so far, tester skill sets are expanding. They are no longer and should never have been the gatekeepers of releases or certifying or verifying that things are ready for production. <laughs> Where you previously had a tester who was I-shaped, who was an extraordinarily good tester. Are there any people here who are certified testers? <laughs> you are limited, wouldn't you? <laughs> okay, I'm a certified tester. I'll just put that up front. I became extremely good at testing. Like my craft of testing became really, really, really well honed. I did every, every specialized course there was on testing. Uh, Katrina mentioned Michael Bolton yesterday. I did his courses. He's, he's amazing. Uh, his colleague James Buck, I did their courses. I did Kim Kainer's course. I did the full um, ISTQB certification. I was a very specialized tester well-honed, well-rounded, experienced tester. But then on the other end of the extreme, you have generalists who are just called engineers who don't have a specialization. And these are the horizontally barred people that you see on my image here. They're the top part of the T. They they, they're only generalists. They don't specialize in anything. So let's bring these together where you now have a role where someone is both a specialist and a generalist. So if you are a developer, you are now expected to know how to test. You're expected to know how to deploy your application. You may even be expected to be on call, which hopefully you are. 
You may even know how to write good requirements or do good UX. So in testing land, that looks like this, where testers now have dev skills, architect skills, BA skills, UX skills, and sysops, as I call it loosely, system engineering. You need all these skills. I'm a T-shaped tester. I can do most of those things, and I have played in all of those ponds. System engineering is, is my, my main interest, which is why you'll find me talking at DevOps conferences and writing for DevOps publications. I'm also doing a, this is not required by the way, but because this is my interest, I am doing a diploma in networking at the moment. I'm CCNA certified. It's just something that I'm interested in. It is part of my T-shape. But my specialization continues to be critical thinking. I'm still a tester, first and foremost. That is my specialization. It is what I bring uniquely to the table. And that's what a T-shaped tester looks like. I will say that um, others have talked about T-shaped roles. It is a common term. It's not something I dreamt of, uh, dreamt up. Uh, Katrina's written a blog on it. I actually have written it. Other people have talked about it. It's an agile term which we now, because DevOps is agile infrastructure, which we now bring into DevOps, because DevOps is agile. Therefore, testing in DevOps is, and this will be no surprise to you, <laughs> you test all the time. If you are shifting left, which you hopefully have by now, you test early. You test in the middle. You test at the end. Everyone is testing. It is now part of your role. The testers are the specialists that you can count on if you're stuck, if you don't know how to test something, so they're the ones you will ask. Just like I will ask my system engineer if I'm stuck uh, in a support call. By the way, if you report to me as a QA, you go on call. You, you carry a pager. Um, pager duty, I see, is, is everyone's favorite here. It is our favorite as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's an app that sits on your phone. It's not really a pager that you carry anymore, but it is something that alerts you to, to the behavior of your production systems. And if you didn't know, production systems behavior is the best mirror of your quality. Don't you think QAs should know what's happening in production? So this is what testing looks like in DevOps. A lot of it is automated. Most of it has to be automated because you need fast feedback. So now that I've coined the term Lean QA, I'm going to explain to you how I summarize it if you haven't already gathered that from the description beforehand. We reducing waste. And waste is included as rework, defects, friction, handovers, excessive documentation. All of that is waste. By holistically testing the whole system early and continuously, including measuring what really matters and incrementally improving thereupon, and employing your humans intelligently. Please do not make them write test cases that are pass and fail outcomes that another human has to execute. Make your machines execute these tests. Make your humans do the intelligent work. All of the above is what I call Lean QA. So thankfully, you don't all have to take a photo of this because I will be sharing my slides with you at the end. I hope I've changed your mind. I hope I've inspired you. I really welcome conversations afterwards. Um, I, I said to someone before I came up that I was going to rattle a few cages. I really hope I did that as well. It is my intention. 
Status quo could be dangerous, and I'm hoping that I've broken some people out of a status quo. Thank you for your time.